Hello, I'm Stan Boltz. I'm the Regional Soil Health Specialist with the uh, USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. I want to thank you, Ruth, for inviting me to talk at the, uh, the virtual No-Till Association um, event here. And I, I uh, am going to talk about, the title is Building Grassland Soil Health. So I'm going to talk about, you know, what soil health looks like on grassland and some management related to that as well. Okay, so um, we, you've probably all seen, or a lot of you have seen the rainfall simulator, and this is uh, some cropland samples showing up here. And uh, these are the jars in front, the runoff jars. And so the jar on the left is conventional till, and you can see the amount of runoff there. The one on the, the right there is, is uh, no till. And so a big difference in those kinds of management on what happens with runoff and the hydrologic processes. Well, in the same way, we see impacts like this on grassland as well. And so this is a, a state and transition diagram for an ecological site description. It's a, it's a description of the plant communities that exist out there and how you can uh, manage to move from one to the other. So we'll just take a look at a couple of these plant communities. That uh, 2.1 that I just covered up, that's this uh, western wheatgrass, needlegrass plant community. That's kind of what it looks like from a picture standpoint. The uh, 3.1, the blue grama, buffalo grass sod, that's, that's a picture of what that looks like. And then moving down to the 4.1 here, that, uh, that looks kind of like this. So when you get uh, Kentucky bluegrass and smooth brome, that's kind of what it looks like. So the decision here is which one do you want to manage for? Which one do you want to, uh, to have on your place as, as your dominant uh, landscape view? So focusing in a little bit more on this uh, state and transition diagram, we're going to look specifically at uh, moving from vegetative state two to vegetative state four. And so these, these larger boxes are what we call vegetative states. And uh, the smaller boxes inside are plant community phases. And so when you uh, move from one to the next, that thicker solid black line is what we call a threshold. And the, the arrows are transitions. And so we're looking at this transition across this threshold between state uh, two and state four, the native invaded grass state and the invaded state, we're going to look at this, this, uh, this threshold right here. And so quite a few uh, uh, scientists and practitioners, people that have worked in the field a long time, got together and they decided to put some numbers, uh, describe this threshold a little bit more uh, specifically. And what they, they came up with was for this threshold, when you for going from the native invaded state to the, to the invaded state, that occurs when the native grasses decline to less than 40% of the plant community and the invasive species such as Kentucky bluegrass increase to greater than 30% of the plant community. So less than 40 native, greater than 30 on the, on the Kentucky bluegrass or smooth grown. So I took those numbers and I looked at what we call our NRI data the National Resources Inventory. We go out and do clippings and, and, and transects to look at the vegetation out across a lot of sites across the state. And uh, this is uh, the major land resource areas, basically uh, geographic regions within the state. And uh, when you look at those numbers that I just showed you and how many points that we had on the ground that, that have already passed that number gone into the invaded state, this is what we see. So. In that upper James Valley uh, area, MLRA 55B, 91% of the sites we sampled have already crossed that threshold. Uh, in the Prairie Coteau, 76% have crossed. And I, I took this sampling, um, I looked at the data, I think it was in 2010 or 2012. So things have changed since then, obviously. But uh, in the lower uh, James Valley area, 76%. In that uh, uh, northern Missouri Coteau, uh, 32 percent um, in the, the uh, lower Missouri Coteau, 35 percent. In the uh, Pier Shale just across the river, um, 18 percent, and in the sandier country down in Memory, 66, 23 percent. So you can see as we move westward, it's the effect is less, but but it seems to be marching westward, and you'll see that in these next couple slides. And so here is uh, the NRI data I mentioned, NRI. 
from 2004 to 2010. And you can see uh, on the eastern side of North Dakota and South Dakota, quite a bit of Kentucky bluegrass and Canada bluegrass is grown in there as well. Now look, when we move it forward to 2015, a lot of the greens and yellows turn to orange and, and burnt orange or whatever that color is. So it's marching westward and it's in, uh, getting on more and more land. And, and I hear that with the range specialists I work with out west that they're seeing Kentucky bluegrass on every site out there. Um, and I bring this up just to say that I, I think this is one of the largest threats to, uh, to native rangeland and sustainability of our grassland and, and productivity over the long term anyway. So what effect do these cool season invasive grasses have on, on the soils? Getting around here to soil health a little bit more. There's two studies, uh, there's more than just these two, but I bring these two up. Um, uh, soil modification by invasive plants, the effects on native and invasive species of mix, mixed grass prairies, and uh, native and non-native grasses generate common types of plant soil feedback by altering soil nutrients and microbial communities. What these two studies both kind of agree on, kind of just a, a short synopsis, is that when these invasive species come in, you have a loss of soil microflora and microfauna. Uh, specifically, the thing that's affected uh, a lot is the native mycorrhizal fungi. And the impact to the native species, it alters soil such that uh, germination even of some of these native species is inhibited. In that, in that first study, they took some uh, native grass seed and put it in soil that had been dominated by smooth brome for a long period of time, and the grass seed wouldn't even germinate. So, so these invasive species have an impact on the soil biology, uh, the soil uh, physical characteristics, and it, it's uh, something that is going to impact us for a long time if we, if we don't manage uh, to, to get, come back to more diversity and more native species. So this is a real busy diagram, but I, I just wanna key you in on a couple things. If you look at the four, um, the four pie charts down here, if I hope you can see my arrow there, but there's uh, there's two colors that dominate in these four pie charts. That's that that kind of burnt red and that green. These are my mycorrhizal species groups, and um, what those represent is cropland. So these are four different uh, uh, types of or cropland with different uh, crops on them and and cover crops. But look at the uh, dominated by those two species groups and not a lot of variety. But up in this, uh, the pie chart up in the center middle almost there, look at the diversity there. A lot more species groups, uh, not dominated so much by certainly those two. If you look at those two colors, they represent specific species groups. And those two colors are very minor on the native prairie. Um, so what we see on native prairie is a lot more diversity in the mycorrhizal fungi and, uh, and the, also uh, Dr. Mike Lehman, um, who, who provided this slide for me, he said that these two groups, this red and green ones, are what, what he considers generalists. So they don't really care who they live with or where they live. They just, they occur in general a lot of times. Whereas up here, these, these species groups uh, go show that native community a lot, a lot more. All right. So, We've been for quite a few years now doing what we call dynamic soil property study. And um, basically what we do is we go out and we take soil samples. Uh, we take five samples. We do that um, on one side of the fence. And then we take similar five samples on the other side of the fence. The thing that's, uh, that ties them together is it's always on the same soil, same ecological site uh, on either side of the fence. The thing that's different is the management. So we try to pick sites that are managed widely differently on each side of the fence, but the same soil, same ecological site. An example of this is, uh, this is in uh, Dual County on a barn soil, but on the left-hand side um, is uh, continuous season long grazing. On the right-hand side, it's been uh, rotationally grazed, uh, good grazing management, high diversity of species. Um, in fact, on the left, when I did the species uh, 
uh, when I counted up the species and did the clipping, it was 93% uh, invasive species, quack grass, Kentucky bluegrass. So 93% invasive. On the right, it was 93% native, only 7% uh, smooth Roman Kentucky bluegrass. So a huge difference in the species composition, and you can see a difference in the, uh, the landscape view there. Um, and here's when we, we dug the soil core on each side of the fence there. On the left is that continuous seasonal lawn grazing. On the right is the moderate, graze, moderate levels of grazing rotation I grade. Look at the difference in the color there. Uh, huge difference, a lot darker soil. When you look at the top eight inches, it's real uh, crumbly granular structure. That's what we like to see. That's good aggregate stability. On the left, it was blocky, um, very hard kind of structure. And uh, so then we, we took some other tests on this soil. And this is the infiltration. So on this barn soil, uh, loamy ecological site, uh, what this represents is uh, we, we put water in a six inch infiltration ring and we put in one inch of water and then we put a second inch on and we, we measure the amount of time it takes for that second inch to soak in. So on the continuous season long uh, grazing side of the fence, it took 109 minutes for that second inch of water to soak in. On the rotationally gray side of the fence on the right, it took 12 minutes. So that's what, uh, this is the lapse time in minutes. Um, that's what that looked like. Looking at a couple other sites, um, this is a site in Hyde County on the Glenham soil. Um, what we were seeing here is the, the grazing stick, the blue grazing stick in the picture on the left represents the fence where these from where these samples were taken. And uh, on the left-hand side was a uh, rotational grazed high diversity of plants. On the right-hand side of the fence, it had been continuous season long grazing for at least 50 years for a long time. And then just nine months prior to when we took this picture, um, they broke out most of the field and put it into cropland. And so that the strip, the 40 foot wide strip that was left along the fence is where we got that sample in the middle. And so you can see, you can see the difference in the color and the structure, uh, and, then, uh, and then look at the difference in the infiltration. On the rotationally gray side of the fence, it was less than five minutes for, for that second inch of water to go in. On the continuous season long graze part, it was 29 minutes for that uh, second inch to go in. And it took two hours for the second inch to go in on the, on the cropland. Huge, huge difference. Here's another one uh, in Millette County on a, on a cube soil. Left-hand side again of the stick is the left side of the fence. Uh, rotationally grazed uh, native uh, diverse rangeland on the right was hayland. It was intermediate wheat grass and alfalfa. Um, it's been in hayland for quite a while, so the alfalfa is kind of going out. Uh, when we when we did the sampling, but uh, look at the difference in color. Uh, you can see that. You can also see the difference in infiltration. And I I bring out infiltration on a lot of these because uh, from the stuff that I've done with this dynamic soil property work, it seems like infiltration is one of the most sensitive uh, indicators uh, for as the overall soil health indicator. It's uh, very sensitive. You can see these huge differences when you when you have different management like this. And so on the on the range, the native diverse rangeland, it took two minutes for that second inch. On the, the hayland, it took 102 minutes, almost two hours. And here's some other things. As you look at this chart, if, um, on the left-hand side is the depth. So that's if you're like, if you're going down in the soil, that uh, horizontal line at the top, think of that as the soil surface. So at the soil surface, um, we had roughly about 8% 8, 8 organic matter on the range on the, on the native grassland side and less than 5% on the hayland. And as you move down in the profile, they come closer together, but you can see, see that significant difference. Look at uh, aggregate stability. On the, on the diverse uh, grassland, we had 80% aggregate stability at the surface. It never looks like it goes below 70% of the of stable aggregates in that profile. And on the hayland at the surface, only 20% of the aggregates were stable. Uh, as you went down the profile, it actually got better, but it never looks like it got above 
The other chart there is uh, beta glucosidase, and that's a, a byproduct of biological activity. So it is, it's an indicator of how much biological activity there is in the soil. And you can see on the native grassland, uh, rotationally grazed, it's, it's uh, pretty much higher all the way down the profile. And so we're seeing more biological activity. Excuse me. So another site in Doyle, uh, Doyle, Dual County, again on a barns, this is comparing rotationally grazed range to cropland. And uh, on the rotationally grazed range, you can see the soil profiles there, quite a bit darker colors further down the profile. Again, 14 minutes for the second inch to go in. On the, on the cropland, it was 146 minutes. Uh, this is in Walworth County, uh, cropland versus uh, grassland again. Uh, 12 minutes versus 120 minutes, two hours. And this is in Bottom County. Um, you, this picture was taken, the, the profile pictures were taken. It was really cloudy that day. So it's not as evident, but when you were on site, you could, the difference in the colors was tremendous. It was a lot darker on the native grassland side. But look at the difference in infiltration. It took about two minutes for that second inch to go in, 167 minutes for the that second inch going on the cropland. And this uh, was continuous corn. It was actually under irrigation, um, but uh, that's just, you know, continuing to look that different. So I say that uh, the two things that really affect hydrology on, uh, and soil health uh, on, but, but definitely hydrology is, is the plant community, the kind of plant community that you have, and then the management. Those two things together really drive how the hydrologic processes uh, work on a site. So we're going to move a little bit into start talking about some of these soil health principles and kind of keep moving into management as we go. Uh, I'm sure you've seen these, a lot of you have seen these principle, uh, soil health principles before. You know, starting in the upper right, we have minimize disturbance, uh, then moving down, maximize soil cover, maximize biodiversity as you keep going around and then maximize the presence of living roots or have a living root for as much of the year as you can. So we're kind of going to go through each one of these and talk about how that, uh, what implications there are for management uh, looking at those. So we're going to start in the upper left hand side, the maximizing uh, living root. On grasslands, you know, because it's it's not like cropland where we have periods of time when there's no living roots. You know, there's living roots out there for pretty much all the year. So what I like to, the way I like to phrase this one is growing and enhancing roots and diversifying roots, if you will. And you know, as you know, with uh, the roots, they they provide uh, really critical functions. You know, they provide the the water and the micronutrients that are key for photosynthesis in the plant above ground. Um, the activity in that rhizosphere is just critical for building soil health. Um, there's so much going on in that rhizosphere. So we need a healthy root and, uh, and a good diverse uh, root structure to have as much rhizosphere activity as possible. And they're very key in uh, building organic matter and the nutrient cycling. So it's, it's uh, very critical that, we, that the root structure and the root uh, diversity, if you will, is, 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 is working really well. This is looking at um, from the left to the right, uh, that's uh, clipped frequently and, and very low to the ground on the left. As you move to the right, it's uh, the frequency uh, decreases as well as the uh, amount of, of uh, herbage removed decreases. And look what it has, what effect it has on the roots. Um, with frequent clipping and, and low clipping, the roots are diminished over time. And uh, as you go to less frequent clipping and, and uh, less herbage removal, you have a lot better root structure. And those, those circles above <clears throat> just represent the different uh, ecological processes, water cycles, the biology, the physical characteristics. Everything is working in a lot higher gear, if you will, on the as you move towards the right than it would be on the left. All those things are not functioning as well when you don't have that, that root structure, obviously. This is a key uh, principle in grazing management and, uh, and grassland management. Uh, it's 
it's what a lot of people refer to as the take half, leave half uh, uh, principle, if you will. So when you look at, uh, this is a study from 1955, uh, the, what they call the Kreider study. Since that time, no one's really refuted this study or been able to disprove it. But what they, what they did is they looked at a number of different grasses and they did that uh, increased frequency and, and, and height of clipping. And uh, just like I showed you in the picture before kind of, and so what they found out is if you remove 10% of the leaf volume above ground, there's no effect on the roots. Go up to 20%, again, no effect, 30%, 40%, no effect. When you hit 50%, they found a 2 to 4% stoppage of root growth. So 2 to 4% of the roots stop growing. When you get to 60%, 50% of the roots stopped growing. And then you move up to 70% of the above ground material removed. And this is just um, uh, like one time, you know, uh, for this period of growth, they were measuring it. 70%, uh, there was a 78% stoppage of root growth. And then you go up to 80% removal, 100% of the roots uh, stop growing. Now, okay, so you say, well, give them a little time, they'll come back. And that's true, but when you look at each level going down, so at 50%, two to 4% of the roots stopped growing and they stopped growing for, I think it was three to four days. As you go to that 60% level, half of the roots stopped growing and it was like for about a week. When you get to the 70% level, 78% of the roots stopped growing and it was more like for three weeks. It stretched out even longer that they stopped growing. So with each level of, of uh, increased utilization, the the number of roots that stopped growing increased as well as the amount of time that they stopped growing for. So you can imagine in a growing season, if you clip heavily one time, those roots may not grow again that year during the growing season, depending on when you graze the grasses. So it's a, it's a key factor to keep in mind in the back of your head when you're, when you're planning for grazing. And then, and here's a, a, a diagram showing uh, different root structures and kind of similar to that, that first one I showed you. But uh, here's looking at on the left, uh, this is just a healthy plant uh, and showing uh, an actual, they actually drew these roots out on, on different uh, grasses. And uh, that's showing the full root system, how everything's healthy. In the middle, what it's, it's showing you is that uh, regardless of the grazing, every year, 30 to 50% of the roots uh, just die back. They die off, or they are consumed, if you will, by the uh, by the biology. So think about that. You have a, a nice, healthy grass on the left there. Every year it has to replace, and they say it's probably closer to fifty percent. Every year it has to replace half of its roots to stay healthy and to keep going. So if you're impacting it on the surface by uh, heavy grazing. What do you think is going to happen with those roots over time? And that's what the picture on the right is showing you. Over time, that's what happens. Those roots diminish because they can't replace themselves. They don't have enough carbon coming down from the, the top to uh, grow new roots and to replace themselves and to stay healthy. So that's, and then what it provides for is the picture shows is the opportunity for other plants to come in. Uh, it opens up spaces for those plants to come in. They may not, may not be plants that you want to have. So let's think about how plants grow a little bit. I'm gonna take you back to high school biology. I think I slipped through this lecture too, but uh, the xylem and the phloem. And I only mention those because uh, to, to kind of show a principle in, in how these plants work. But the xylem, its main function is to transport water from the roots up and it can bring water and some of the smaller um, micronutrients and, and things like, you know, uh, potassium and magnesium, other things, the building blocks that the plant uses to carry on the photosynthesis. But to keep in, what to keep in mind is that the, the larger molecules, the, the complex carbohydrates um, are not transported through the xylem for the most part from the roots up to the plant. The phloem on the other hand, that's when, you know, after the plant does photosynthesis, it builds these sugars, these non-structural carbohydrates and it sends them down to the roots. And of course, that, that carbon is going down there. Uh, a big portion of it's being used to rebuild the root structure, as I said, at 30 to 50% that dies off every year. 
it's also used for respiration, you know, and the, the plant has to, to live just like anything else up above ground and below ground. So a lot of that carbon is being used for respiration too, just uh, doing its thing every day. All right, so let's look at the, I like to call these the leaves, the facts of growth. Uh, so we've talked about this roots uptake and send water, minerals, and micronutrients up to the above ground part, the leaves up above ground. However, roots do not transport carbohydrates from below the ground up to the plant above ground. But we all know that leaves are living things. They have to respire, so they use energy, carbohydrates, to do that, that respiring, that respiration. So where does that, that car, those carbohydrates come from for the plant above ground to, to live? Well, what they found is that five to 10% of new leaf growth, and this is after a grazing event or after, you know, in the spring when the plant uh, breaks dormant and, and starts growing, five to 10% of that new leaf growth is from the residual sheath that's left uh, after grazing. And the, the crown right at the, the ground level and they've also found a, a new site pretty recently, and that's in these nodes that grasses have. If you look at the, uh, this is a large, enlarged view of this area right here, the grass node. And in there, they have found another storage site for carbohydrates, not super large, but there are some uh, carbohydrate storage sites within these nodes that grasses have. So that's, that's pretty cool. But think about that from the sheath, from the right at the ground level, the crown, Right at the ground level, and then the nodes, that five to 10% of that new leaf growth comes from there. The rest of new growth in a, in a grass plant has to come from current photosynthesis. So 90 to 95% of new leaf growth and plant growth comes from current photosynthesis being carried on by the, the leaves uh, after they get that kickstart. So the bottom line is it takes leaves to make leaves. And so you think about uh, one of the principles of life you've probably heard, it takes money to make money. Uh, another way of saying it, or to everyone who has, shall more be given. Well, in the same way, uh, this is the thing I'd like to say, it takes leaves to make leaves. But not only that, uh, it takes leaves to feed the soils and the microbial life and uh, underground as well. So that's a, that's a key factor to remember when you're trying to, to think about grazing management. And uh, this impact is, is more than just during the season. So if this is kind of a busy chart, but uh, this is from the Nebraska South Dakota Drought Management Handbook. And what's showing is how plant communities uh, can weather through drought. And so um, in what this is starting in 1963, they started collecting this data. It went from 63 uh, through to 1968. And what it's not showing you is in 1961 and 62, there was a pretty severe drought in that area. And, um, and so what they looked at is two different plant communities. One was in fair condition, one was in excellent condition, what we used, we used to call it range condition. And so for two years, they were in drought. They, and this is what happened in 1963. So this, um, this blue line here represents the average precipitation for that site. And the stars represent uh, the precipitation for that given year. And then these uh, solid bars represent the production or the yield for each of those two, the excellent and fair. So 1961, 62, it was below average rainfall. And here's 1963, they had average rainfall. And look at the production between those two plant communities. The fair was only about a third, if that, of the 1,200 pound average for that site. Uh, the excellent plant community uh, or excellent range condition plant community, uh, it suffered for a year there, but look what happens the next year. It almost rebounds all the way after two years of, of, of regular precip. The, the site that was in poor condition going into the drought, it took longer for it to come to rebound. In fact, by the third year, it still had not recovered up to the 1200 pound level up, up in here somewhere. Uh, whereas the, uh, the site that was in better condition or better management going into the drought recovered uh, beyond the normal production level. Then in 1966, another below average year, boy, it really hammered those, both of those plant communities. <laughs> they had very little production that year. But one year of above average rain 
look what happens with the, the plant community that was in good condition going into that drought, rebounded completely. The site that was in pretty rough condition going into the drought, it took it again two years and it still hasn't come back to the normal production. So that's with management going into a drought, you can build resiliency from uh, to take you through those droughts. And that's built up in those roots and those structures underground for the, uh, for the most part. All right, so let's move on to the next principle, keeping the soil covered. Um, if, you know, if the soil is bare, more water is gonna be lost by evaporation than by transpiration, which means the plants aren't uh, getting use of that water for, for growth and doing all the things they need to do. So we wanna keep some cover out there. I'm gonna talk about it a little bit differently than, uh, than we do typically on, on cropland. On cropland, we say uh, maximize cover. And uh, on, on grasslands though, the way I, I word that principle is optimize cover. And we'll talk about that a little bit more here. But uh, so you, you can see from this kind of cute little diagram here <laughs> that the uh, hot soil temperatures, uh, they, they produce excessive soil moisture loss, but they also uh, cause some of the microbes to either to go into dormancy or to actually die. And the effects of temperature can be tremendous. Uh, and you just don't, you don't see it necessarily by looking at the, at the, the site, just standing there looking at it. So this was a picture I took at, at a grazing school, and I was mainly taking the picture to show, hey, we're out there doing our grazing exercise, and here's the trailer, and, the, and everything's kind of cool. But um, if you look at kind of where that porta potty is, if you stand there, the fence line uh, running there behind behind that that heifer is going east and west. If you stand at that porta potty and look due north, one of the things you see is on the right hand side of that uh, th 320 acres, it's half a section. The right-hand side, it's, it's pretty green and there's a line, right? Just straight as you look north. It, uh, to the right, it's green. To the left, it's kind of yellow. And uh, we asked the owner of the property here, he said, what's, what's going on with that line? He said, well, on the left-hand side, it was hayed for you know, 50 years probably, or 40 years, he said, 40 plus years. On the right-hand side, it's never been hayed, but it's been grazed on both sides. And for the last 10 years leading up to that, that time, he had not hayed the left-hand side. He had just grazed it the same way as he grazes the right. So we did a little soil health uh, demonstration out there. We went on the right-hand side and the left-hand side. And uh, it was amazing. Got to look at my notes here, but um, the air temperature that day was about 90 degrees. When we took the temperature on the left-hand side that had been hayed, you know, up to the last 10 years previously, the temperature at the surface was 102 degrees Fahrenheit. 104 is considered kind of the upper upper end of the scale that most of these critters like to live. You know, that's kind of the, after that they either go dormant or they start dying off. So it was 102 degrees, even though there was grass cover, the soil temperature was 102 on a 90 degree day. On the right-hand side that had never been hayed, it was 87, uh, 87 degrees at the soil surface. So what is that a, you know, almost, uh, uh, almost 20 degrees, not quite 15 degree difference in temperature, but uh, tremendous difference. And, and even though both sides had cover, that, that previous management uh, had had an impact on the soil for quite a while. So why do we wanna keep the ground cover? Well, obviously for erosion purposes, you know, this is a raindrop impact. A lot of you have seen that picture. When we have bare ground on rangeland, we can start, if you look right in the middle picture, it's starting to form a rill. Uh, as you continue to have bare ground, uh, then you'll start to see uh, pedestal plants and these, what we call terraset, where there's a buildup of soil behind a debris dam or some obstruction. As you keep going, you'll start to see water flow patterns. And you can actually see on the picture where the water flow is going across the land there. Um, as you keep going with this, uh, now we're actually starting to see the formation, the beginning of head cuts out on the land surface uh, when we don't have cover. Keep that going. Uh, now we're getting a small gully out there right across, right in the middle of the landscape um, and, and bigger gully. So, so obviously we wanna keep cover out there for erosion purposes, keep the land 
uh, you know, solid and, and intact and stuff. But is there such a thing as too much, too much of a good thing? On grasslands, I would say yes. You know, we want to keep cover out there, but you can take it to too much of an extreme as well. These are pictures of, of what happens with what you can see with excessive litter. Um, and look at that, the picture in the center at the bottom uh, right here. Look at that. That layer is what we call a thatch mat layer. It's just a buildup of, of lignified uh, plant material that will not decompose anymore. And because of this impact on the biology, it's the saprophytic fungi have been removed, I think, and that's uh, removing those, those critters that can actually break down that the lignin. And so it exacerbates the problem. And so that, that impacts the, the processes on a site. What, what can it do? So it can shift energy flow from full season. So having a mixture of cool season grasses and warm season grasses, you have that energy, uh, that energy cycle moving all the time. It can shift that from that full season that we normally have in a diverse community to more of a narrower window that you get with the Kentucky bluegrass and smooth brome. It can lead to a reduction in the amount of carbon sequestered in the profile and that uh, carbon that's sent down to the roots to build those roots. Um, it can reduce infiltration. Um, uh, after that thatch layer builds up, uh, it, it may actually be able to soak up a lot of rain in the thatch layer, but that water is still not getting down into the soil, the actual soil. It can also lead, and we've seen this quite a bit, an alteration of the soil structure. So that typical granular structure structure that we see in a healthy rain or grassland soil uh, can change to subangular blocky or actually play the structure right under that, that thick thatch layer. And uh, changes in root morphology, the roots become much shallower in depth and not spread down through the profile. And a severe reduction in the native mycorrhizal fungi is, is like I showed you before on that, um, that, that slide with the pie charts. And it's also thought to create an imbalance in the nitrogen in the system. In a, in a typical grassland system, they kind of consider it a nitrogen starved system or nitrogen uh, uh, efficient system because there's no leftover nitrogen hanging around. When you, when you get this imbalance and the energy cycle gets messed up, then you start building up extra nitrogen. That leads actually to a decrease in diversity and an increase in, in weedy weeds and stuff like that. All right, so that's cover. Let's look at that maximized diversity. And the principle here really is, is diversity above ground equals diversity below ground. So the more diversity you have above ground, typically the more diversity you're going to have below ground. And these are all pictures of really nice diverse uh, plant communities. Again, just going back to that chart, that kind of busy chart, but the, the four cropland ones, not super diverse. The, the grassland, the diverse grassland site, very diverse. So mycorrhizal fungi, actually they grow into the plant roots and these little, uh, these little tree kind of looking things, that's arbuscular, that's what that term means, that they look like a tree. Those are actually growing into the plant roots and in between the plant root cells. And uh, they, they form an association that's really critical for the plant. They say that, probably 80% of the plants out on grasslands are obligates to this mycorrhizal relationship, mycorrhizal fungi relationship. They have to have it in order to stay healthy and grow. So that's, that's pretty interesting. So think about weeds, you know, they actually do in some cases add to diversity. Are weeds a good thing or a bad thing? Look at the uh, this lamb's quarter in this picture actually has a protein content, food protein content of 18%. You look at a couple other, just look at the weeds, the, the, the forbs, most people would consider them weeds, Carolina geranium, evening primrose, pepperweed, curly dock. Look at the percent of crude protein in those critters. You can ignore the rest of that slide, but uh, amazing amount of protein. So I like to call it a weed opportunity instead of opportunity. Uh, don't look as weeds is necessarily a bad thing. Uh, think about this. Um, if you start to see weeds out there, um, first step is identify the weed. What is the weed? Make sure it's a, actually a, you know, 
make sure it's not noxious, but make sure it's, you know, a real weed that might cause you problems or something. Take a step back and evaluate though. Weeds oftentimes are a symptom. It's like uh, nature saying, hey, something's going on here. I'm gonna kick some weeds out there to take, you know, get your attention. But just take a step back, evaluate, see if there's something you're doing with your management. Maybe that's, that's leading to some of this. Sometimes it's just the weather. Sometimes you'll see just a, a bump of curly cup gum weed or, or burn snake weed, you know, whatever it is that comes in and in certain years and then goes away after a while. This is one of my favorite quotes. I think I have it in this presentation twice. But uh, Jim Falstick from, uh, from the Highmore area. Those weeds can be, can be valuable. So use what you've got, manage for what you want. You know, don't just, uh, last step, you know, as a last resort, yeah, you know, you might need to do some herbicide control. But don't, don't jump to that step when you start to see what you think might be weeds out there. This is a, a website called Livestock for Landscapes, uh, Kathy Voth. She has actually uh, worked with producers to train cattle to eat a lot of these weeds that you would think they'd never eat. And that list, um, the edible plant list, all these plants are, are plants that she successfully trained cattle to eat and not just you know, nibble on, but actually uh, voraciously consume. So uh, it's, it's quite a deal, but if the cattle can use it, you're not going to uh, you're not going to have to deal with it, and it's going to be actually a benefit instead of a negative thing. All right, so the I think this is the last principle. Again, on uh, cropland, they say minimize disturbance. Um, I like to call it optimizing disturbance. So it's it's uh, because on grassland, from an ecological standpoint, a disturbance is not not inherently bad or good. Um, the same management action that can result in negative or positive feedback, depending on, on the timing and intensity. So that what you call, you know, an grazing event can be a good thing or a bad thing. Even it just depends on the timing and the intensity. And um, actually, non-use for extended periods of time is considered a disturbance on grasslands, and it can cause negative results. On the right-hand side, that little inset picture. Um, some of you probably recognize that, but what that is is uh, the June bug grubs, they get in the soil and then skunks and badgers come out and they dig up the soil. And actually where we see it the worst though is where we have that Kentucky bluegrass mat and the June bug grubs get right underneath that mat. So they're like an inch below the surface and the skunks and the badgers peel that back and eat the grubs. and uh, and so that's the disturbance there. You think, oh, that's just ruined that range. But actually what, what we've seen after a couple of years, some of those areas that were disturbed by the skunks and badgers have come back to more uh, productive grasses and some weeds too, but uh, like Western wheatgrass comes back where it was just Kentucky bluegrass. So it might be a good thing sometimes. How did, and you know, after all, how did the prairie develop? It developed from disturbances. So we, we obviously think about uh, bison, Fire was a big one, but the one that a lot of people overlook, I think that probably had probably the largest impact on the, on the development of the prairie is insects. Uh, if you think about uh, leading up to the early 1900s, um, probably two or to three years out of five, there was these big uh, locust infestations across the plains, totally wipe out the grass, the crops. Uh, it was just devastating. The, the uh, the America the U.S. government spent you know in terms of if you equivalent billions of dollars trying to fight the locusts at that time. Um, over time, and that if you get a chance, check out this book. It's a to me it was a fascinating book. It talks about how they just disappeared and what happened with them. Um, so, but you think about it, for years and years, uh, even before we settled a lot of that area, the locusts were uh, oftentimes coming out and just wiping out the vegetation for short periods of time, but having an impact on the landscape. Another book that's really interesting is The Nature of Eastern North Dakota, the pre-1880 historical ecology. And one of the things I gleaned out of there is that the bison were not necessarily these, uh, you know, these critters that roamed across the landscape and grazed everything evenly. They actually, they were quite a bit like cattle, if you will. They, uh, from what they could tell, they 
they oftentimes would graze some areas a lot heavier and other areas they wouldn't graze at all just like a just like in some of our pastures just on a much much larger scale so um that's a it's an interesting book too it's uh it makes you think about some of these concepts that we've thought of thought about and maybe thought about differently and don't forget dung beetles they are very key to managing out there they help you manage uh, uh, the fecal material and control and by doing that they help control pests as well for the cattle but they they can move a ton of material i mean literally a ton more than that but uh you have several different kinds of dung beetles you have uh, the ones that dwell in the manure that just live their most of their life cycle in the manure then you have uh the ones that actually from the manure paddy they burrow down into the soil below the manure paddy and then you've got the ones that everybody likes to take pictures of the tumblers they they roll it up in a ball <clears throat> roll it to a place and then they and they bury it this is a, a really cool deal the more uh dung beetles you see the probably the healthier your system is overall all right so let's talk about grazing systems what are some keys to to setting up a grazing system some things to think about for management there are three critical things in my mind and that's Number one, and it's not in any order, but the three top ones there, uh, utilization rate. How much am I taking off? The second one is, is making sure you have adequate recovery periods. And then the third one is, is changing the season of use. So those three things, your stocking rate, your recovery periods, and changing season of use, those are really the three key factors and thinking about grazing management and setting up a grazing system. I like to throw a fourth one in. I think it's just good for, for our neck of the woods and that's uh, as much as possible, strive for year round grazing and making sure or trying to make most of your, your forage harvested by that four-legged harvester out there. The key here is it's, it's about adaptive management, you know, regardless of whatever system you use, even continuous, seasonal grazing can still be beneficial, but uh, rotational grazing usually is easy to manage, but uh, it's, it's making sure that you're, the manager is responding to feedback from the system and using that information to adapt their management to fit the ecosystem and the situation at hand. So it doesn't matter, one system is not necessarily better than another, but it's, it's being adaptive in that management. Um, if you're just kind of getting started into this stuff, uh some people say oh man this is i, I wanted i saw this guy that did rotational grazing i want to do it i'm going to break up my my three pastures into 40 and i'm going to start doing uh, one of the things we see a lot of times is they try to do too much too fast so uh, when they when they start changing some of this so the just a you know word of advice uh start slowly and interestingly enough the biggest bang is going to be with that first division of of fence in a pasture you think if you graze one pasture for the whole growing season or grazing season you know typical six month uh, grazing season the first division of fence you're going to go from zero days of rest to with two paddocks to 90 days of rest on either side uh, three paddocks it's going to move up to 120 days but you see as you increase the number of paddocks the the impact kind of reduces but it's still it does improve but that that first fence is going to be the biggest bang. It's just an example of a of a producer I worked with out on uh, West River. Um, this is his uh, ranch on the north side of his ranch. All that stuff that's in blue was in hay. Um, those two fields there were crested wheatgrass. You can see the fences kind of where they are. These three fields that are in green was his range land or his grassland. And so the, the things the observations that we made when we went out there, uh, he was really putting up too much hay. He had more hay every year than he needed, um, you know, and, and that's okay, you sell it off, you know, and stuff, that's not a bad thing necessarily, but, but he was putting up his balance, if you balance between grazing and hay, he had a lot more hay than he had, you know, grazing forage resources. Uh, the crested wheatgrass, year in and year out, was being overutilized, it was just being hammered. Um, this fence right here was just not in a good location, we decided after looking at it. And this steep terrain, if you look uh, in this area, it's pretty flat. Um, 
up here it's, it's pretty steep terrain. And so that's an that's, uh, area that was being underutilized. The cows just never got up there. And, uh, and this, these two pastures were too large. The distribution was really uneven. So what we did working with him, we, um, this area that was in blue, that was hayland, we kind of took some of that out of hayland and put it into, into a grazing, uh, grazing. So, and then here's the area down below. This, this fence I talked about, um, we took that fence out and we put some other fences. Look, we, we moved that one fence up closer to the crested wheatgrass. And so that tightened up that area around the crested wheatgrass so it could be managed better. Then he, he put another fence in uh, right up against the hills so it could, he could manage that as a unit and subdivided uh, the, the pasture over there into three. So what we looked at was topography, the forage types and production and realistic movements that would work for him. The water flow, before you do this kind of thing, you gotta make sure you can put water where it's gonna actually work for your fence locations. All right, so when you start managing some of these things, you're gonna start seeing changes uh, if you change your management. It might be in animal performance, production or vigor in plants, and in time, a shift in plant composition. But is it where you want it to go? So these are some uh, goals or visions that four different producers I know have, have I've seen them talk about over the years. And I just, every one of these is good, but it's, an, it's the idea that you need to have a vision for your own landscape. Uh, here's, here's some of them. This one person said, almost every raindrop should infiltrate where it falls. The water cycle should be very efficient to minimize erosion. One guy said, maximum diversity, not you know optimize, but maximum diversity of native plant species. The other one said, nutrient cycling to be high with minimum losses to leaching and runoff. Energy flow to be high and sustained. One guy wanted living, non-eroding soil with high complexity of life and high organic matter content. Uh, almost all the nutrients supplied by the soil, efficient use of the forage base while promoting healthy range conditions. So here's another state and transition diagram. Just think about uh, that one, uh, 2.1, that's kind of what it looks like. 2.2, the Western wheatgrass, blue grama sedge, that's what it looks like. Western wheatgrass, Kentucky bluegrass, here's your Kentucky bluegrass move them. Do any of these plant communities work for your management? How can, I, how can you get there? So that's what a state and transition diagram can help with is what it'll describe the plant communities and it'll tell you how you can manage for one or against another problem. Here's a you know, buffalo, a blue grama buffalo grass sod. Interesting picture here. Uh, a friend of mine gave me this picture. Both of these guys, these are two different operators on either side of the fence. Both of them have employed a rotational grazing system. Look at the impacts though. Just because it's rotational, it doesn't mean that it's doing the same thing on both sides. So that's the thing is it's that adaptive management. What you do, how you do it and, and keep your eyes open. That's gonna matter more than necessarily having a plan on paper that they may look identical, but how it's managed is where it really comes down. And also you wanna measure how things are going. You wanna keep track of that and see where, uh, where you're going, you know. Uh, Calvin Adams, the rancher from uh, Kansas said, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And I already mentioned this quote, uh, kind of relates to, to watching what you have, you know, use what you've got, but manage for what you want. The only way you're gonna know if you're getting there is by seeing if what you want is coming back. Um, this uh, Lord Calvin guy, he said, when you can measure what you were speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. When you can't express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meager and unsatisfactory kind. He's the guy that came up with the Kelvin scale of temperature. But, so if you're going to know whether you're succeeding in reaching your objectives, you need to measure the results of your management changes. If you aim at nothing, you're sure to hit it. All right, so this is, uh, this is from our monitoring tool in the, on our range and drought page from the South Dakota NRCS webpage. And this is basically saying, this is a little busy, but. Basically what it's doing is taking uh, your objective, your management objective across the top. And it's saying for each one of those, what monitoring methods can I use to decide if I'm reaching one of those objectives? So that's, that's in the monitoring tool. It's just a way of helping you pick out what kind of monitoring to do. But whenever you look at monitoring, you wanna select methods that are simple, you know, 
within reason so that you can complete, uh, you're gonna complete them, you're not gonna just give up on them. Uh, it tells you something about the objective. So use what, that table to figure out if, if that actually does address the objective you're trying to reach. And uh, try to pick ones that serve multiple purposes so that you're gaining more information from one kind of piece of data. Photographs are, are like the first step. Uh, they tell you so much, you know, it, it really is true that a picture is worth a thousand words, but they're easy to do. There's a, an app for smartphones and I checked uh, yesterday, it's available both on iPhones and, and uh, Androids, but it's called GraphSnap. It's an excellent uh, smartphone app. You, it'll help you organize your pictures. It keeps track of where they are. And then um, just, it's a way of, of keeping track of that. And uh, this is just using a grazing stick. You measure the production in your pastures, put it in a spreadsheet, and then it'll sort it out for you. And uh, you can decide the pastures that are nearest the top red line. Those are the ones you want to come to next in grazing. The ones that are near the bottom line, you want to get out of there before you keep grazing those. Some other methods and tools, uh, the great South Dakota grazing tool, uh, North Dakota has one as well. Uh, animal performance, weights on and off, body condition score. Uh, again, the monitoring tool for measuring cover, plant height production. And from a soil health standpoint, a lot of things, that shovel in the picture there, that's, the shovel is gonna tell you a lot. You dig a hole, look at aggregate stability. Do, get one of those infiltration rings, look at infiltration. Um, look at the structure of your soil. That's gonna tell you a lot. So, you know, basically you're using this information to see if your objectives are being reached. Are you moving towards or away from that threshold? optimizing your production. And uh, this, I'm probably gonna end with this slide right here, but this is uh, one rancher started looking at his information and, uh, and he just showed what happened with his, uh, his pounds of beef per acre that he was, he was getting, his percent increase of production over time. But one of the things he really wanted to look at was organic matter. And look at from uh, when he got the place, it was season long grazed before that, his organic matter was 1.4. And you can see this trend of increasing organic matter up until 2012, which was a drought year. But, but he could see, he actually knows that his management is doing some one of the goals that he wanted to do. So I'm just gonna uh, slip past this slide. You don't know where you're, you don't know where you're going until you know where you've been, I guess, just a quote there. All right, <laughs> so yeah, I, I put up my, my email address there. It's uh, stanley.bolts at usda.gov. Uh, feel free to send me emails and, and uh, you know, yeah, I, I work out of the office in Huron. Um, you can reach me if you look at the South Dakota NRCS webpage. Uh, the phone number's right there. You can call and they can get a hold of me. Um, so, uh, yeah, feel free. Don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions or comments and, or if you want to uh, refute anything there that I may have flipped up on so <laughs> but uh yeah i guess i appreciate the opportunity to do this thank you ruth again and uh, wish we could have been in person but uh yeah i think that this will work pretty good though i think so people can watch it and scrutinize it even closer that way <laughs>